In December of 2002, one of my best friends, Richard, was getting married. I had moved off the peninsula a few years before and had never met her, but apparently they had been together a while. Against my advice, he had joined the Marines and was marrying his girl before he shipped off to Iraq for his first tour. My other two best friends, Kyle and Westy, came back to our old hometown of Port Angeles for the wedding as well. We had a good time the night before the wedding and woke up early to make the 50 mile drive to Forks for the ceremony at the courthouse. Things started out badly as the tire on my car blew out early on the way there and we were forced to make the rest of the trip on my spare, driving under 20 miles an hour. We were almost late, but we made it and they had a nice little ceremony before we went to the bride's grandmother's house for the reception. The festivities didn't end until well after dark. The drive back to Port Angeles was too risky to make with a spare tire. It was overcast, foggy, and pitch black. There were no street lamps on the highway between Forks and Pennsylvania. My car was small and black, and we had almost been hit by speeding cars in the daytime. So I wasn't going to be able to get back to Pennsylvania until I had a new tire, but there was nowhere left in Forks open to buy one at that time of night. So we were going to have to find somewhere to bed down until the morning. The bride asked if we could crash at her grandmother's, but the grandmother said that she was afraid of the things that we could do to her in the night. Obviously, she was out of her mind. It was way too cold to sleep in the car. I had spent too much money on the party the night before, being the best man and all, and we couldn't get the money together for a room. The bride suggested her other grandma's cabin. Her other grandma had passed away a few months ago, and the cabin she lived in out towards La Puche was vacant. My friend Kyle inexplicably said, no way, I'm gonna take the last bus back to Pennsylvania. I'll see you tomorrow. And walked out the door without another word. That should have been a big clue to me that something was wrong, but I was stuck because I wasn't going to abandon my car. I grabbed my things, and Richard and his new wife drove us to her dead grandma's cabin about 15 minutes outside of town. It was in the middle of nowhere, and although they called it a cabin, it was more of a two-story house. There was a lamp in the driveway, but other than that, everything was pitch black out. Richard and his bride let Westy and I inside and had a look around with us. Most of the furniture had already been removed by her family. There was a card table and a few metal chairs in the kitchen and a wardrobe still in the only bedroom. The wardrobe, however, was completely empty. Its contents were in a pile in the middle of the room and formed a man-sized nest. My uncle uses this place as a hunting lodge sometimes He's a bit crazy. He hasn't gotten over grandma's death, she volunteered. If he finds you here, he'll be really mad. So you should probably hide if you hear him. But he leaves a lot of Pepsi and beer in the fridge, so you can help yourself. Westy and I felt exactly as you'd imagine we did. But at this point, it was either stay here in the cabin with heat, or try to sleep outside where it's below freezing. Richard and his wife went to go have their wedding night, while Westy and I tried to figure out exactly where we were going to hide, if said crazy uncle did come around. There was a set of retractable stairs going up to the attic, where we found a couple of dusty, stained single mattress covers with old handmade quilts and the husk of a thousand dead insects we decided it was best to retract the stairs and hide out in the attic for the night. Apparently, the crazy uncle preferred to sleep 
in a pile of his dead mother's clothes. The kitchen was devoid of knives, but I found a wood splitting maul on the back porch, which we kept upstairs with us just in case. In my backpack, I still had a couple of malt liquors left over from the night before. Without TV or radio or any other form of entertainment, Westy and I sat on the mattresses, drinking Mad Dog 2020 and talking about old times with all the trouble that Richard had gotten himself into this time. Without any clocks available, we lost track of time and had a decent buzz going. What we heard sobered us up pretty quickly. We heard a noise that sounded like the doorknob downstairs being shaken violently. With wide eyes, we looked over at each other and listened carefully. The noise occurred a few more times, and I slowly moved to the window to try and quickly peek out to see if there was a car in the lamp-lit driveway. There was nothing. We sat silently for a while and heard nothing. We began to talk again, but once again, were interrupted by what sounded like the refrigerator slamming shut and chairs being moved across the floor. There were no voices. I grabbed them all and waited at the top of the still retracted stairs. As suddenly as the noise started, it stopped, and we waited in silence but heard nothing. We were freaked out. We couldn't go to sleep, but we got bored and began talking again in a whisper. Without a clock or watch, I don't know how long after we heard the chairs move, but it was when the phone began to ring. We waited for the phone to stop ringing, or for somebody downstairs to answer it, but nothing happened. The ringing kept going. It kept ringing beyond what any normal person would wait for an answer. I figured the crazy uncle, if he was there, would have picked it up a long time ago. So, we were probably alone. The only person who knew we were here was Richard and his wife. With the number of rings, I assumed it was an emergency. I lowered the stairs and took them all with me just in case. I braced for an attack, but no one came. Nobody was waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs and I could see the kitchen was clear. I walked over to the still ringing phone and picked it up. The ringing stopped, but there was no dial tone. The phone was dead. I picked up the phone and looked at it. It wasn't plugged into the wall. It was an old rotary phone with a mechanical belt that looked like it had been made back in the 60s. It sat there silent. I used the bathroom and went back upstairs and told Westy about the phone. He said I was messing with him, but I assured him I wasn't and told him to go and look for himself. Westy, suffice to say, was pretty freaked out. He needed to take a leak, but was too afraid to go downstairs. Instead, he peed out of the second floor window into the cold night air. The window stuck open, and it was freezing. I was freaked out and mad. The phone started ringing again. We sat and counted the rings. I remember counting as high as 170 when I decided it was useless. I wasn't going back downstairs to answer an unplugged phone. I lay down on the mattress, listening to the phone ring and passed out. In the morning, Westy and I woke up early and freezing. We had no idea when Richard would be coming for us, but we decided we would search around for another phone. The night before, I had heard the unplugged phone ring right in front of me, but I was skeptical. We searched all over. There was only one phone on the property. It was the one sitting unplugged in the kitchen. I looked it over. There was nothing funny about it at all. No batteries, no dial tone, nothing.
I am an outdoorsman. I am very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I am very familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid, called the Dogman. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how it did, and it was not a normal wolf, as they cannot comfortably run on two legs. Whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing so. I'm going to elaborate further. This happened around June of 2007. I was around 17 years old, and more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in Northwest Wisconsin, and I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night, it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night, you always felt like you were being watched. From that tree line, but during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is until this incident. This happened somewhere between twelve and two. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle, so I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us 200 meters into about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me. When I decided to mess with him, I shushed him and said, "We're being watched." He froze. Then I realized the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked, and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right. When I saw it, its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least three hundred pounds. But it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to the tree, with its arm grasping it, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish brown fur, and I told my cousin, "We have to go." And the next thing I know, he is sprinting, and I look back at Wolfie, who has locked on and sprinted a few more steps, and then I turned and ran. When it looked like Wolfie was dropping to all fours, it charged us and sounded right up our asses, barreling through the brush. But for whatever reason, let us go when we broke out of the tree line, and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size. Wolfie appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws. It appeared to have large clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I have heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big, and black bears more waddle on two legs. The closest description is silly, but I would say, a werewolf, or dog man. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike back to a country campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree, 
beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip I do, I always conduct a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness meant for backpackers or through hikers, really looking to escape the crowd in more popular areas of forest. Though as time went on, and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled, except Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing it with a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility. So, there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling, alongside the Amunusuk River. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the dry river valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled tree line down to the dry river shelter number three, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparringly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least, we would be having some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit along a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small boundary notebook nestled in the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page in a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of human or even animal disturbance on the trails, or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation in order to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirps of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting, and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to, and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking eight plus miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me up. The only thing I could compare the noise to were to be someone swinging a two by four onto a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. 
I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put that thing back where I found it, which involved closing it and putting it in the back corner of the shelter. I most certainly didn't leave it open on the floor. Hey Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, passed out man. It's not like there's anything to read anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler whose name was originally on the first page could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what was on the page. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we could have missed all these names. How the hell could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the results of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's a bear. Now let it go. And, well, we did. Ellis led us out onto the site and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? I encountered what I believe to be a dog man. I lived in Southern California at the time up in San Gabriel Mountains, a few hours east of LA. I know what people think of Cali. All they seem to picture are beaches, but I assure you the land here is diverse. My hometown is super tiny and has a fairly popular ski resort on the western side of town. If you take the only highway out past the ski resort for several miles, it's nothing but forest. There are a few campgrounds and day use areas, a couple of forest service buildings and a very old gold mine out there. After those things, there is nothing but national forest and then one insanely isolated very old restaurant that still functions and then back to the forest for a long time. Anyway, I'm just setting the scene a little bit. I was about 10 to 11 when this happened. It was almost Christmas. It had snowed quite a bit that year and was snowing on the evening that this happened. My stepdad decided that we would cut our own tree that year and we got into my mum's big Dodge truck and headed off towards the mine, which was a couple of miles past the ski resort. We got to the base of the road and were talking and laughing. My stepdad was driving pretty slowly since it was snowing pretty good, and they had ploughed part of this road recently too, and there were big snow berms on either side of the road, damn near up to the top of the truck cap, so probably about a good eight feet off the ground. It's barely getting dark at this time too, not quite dark, but twilight perhaps. We can't see that much and the truck's headlights are on. Quite suddenly from over my side, there comes a huge dark shape that arcs over the top of the snow berm. It lands in the middle of the road fairly gracefully and my stepdad slams on the brakes. I'm too stunned to speak or scream because there crouching in the road 
is a damn werewolf. I can't describe it as anything else. It had a long muzzle and pointy ears, like a dog or a wolf, but pointier, and was covered in fur. Its paws were long digits that ended in claws. Not quite a hand, but not quite a paw either. It reminded me more of a raccoon hand, and I honestly don't remember it having a tail. It was very large, and looked strong. This all happened in mere seconds. The thing jumps down and lands in a crouch, briefly glances at us in the truck, and my stepdad slammed on the brakes, and then it just vaulted up over the berm on the left side as easy as pie. It didn't use all force to jump, it just crouched on its hind legs and jumped. If I had to guess, I would say it's at least six to seven feet tall, if it was standing up straight. More than a little terrifying, even if it was a simple and extremely quick encounter. My stepdad refused to talk about it when I asked. I asked him if he'd seen the same thing, and I knew he must have, because he hit the brakes so fast, and he was wide-eyed, and his face had broken into a sweat. I never did bring it up again, because we didn't have the best relationship, and I haven't spoken to him since he and my mum got divorced. I do sometimes think about it though, and I'm very tempted to contact him just to ask, but I don't know if it will be worthwhile, or if he even remembers. But I can never forget it. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist, and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. For my first assignment, I received GPS coordinates, and I either had to drive or hike to the designated spot and do what they wanted me to do. This could be setting up trail cameras and or counters, monitoring equipment, trail surveys and the like, and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground, and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but others are way off trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough, as these are in very remote mountains, and the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dang camping gear on the occasion I may have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper, and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I am a woman of about 5 foot 6, 130 pounds, but not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So I've been assigned to this district for a few months now, and have really enjoyed my work. This is a very remote and unspoiled area, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I've had so many positive and almost spiritual moments up until a few nights ago. I was working up near one of the highest points in the state, with a complex system of trails, wilderness areas and camping. It has also been snowing with howling winds and ice storms, and I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp, and drank some whiskey, and smoked some really good bud. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold, but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing, and don't feel the cold all that much. I woke up at dawn, and went about building my fire back up, and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone, or something, had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras, 
and didn't really have time to wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything, because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals, people, or anything before I see them. It was already past dark when I arrived back to my camp, and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get into my sleeping bag and pass out. Around 2am, I woke up because I could hear people talking. People? I was around 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and about 10 miles from where my truck was parked and I could hear voices. I completely lost it. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back in my sleeping bag and cocked it and waited. I was on high alert. All of my senses were going wild. Eventually the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore, but I never went back to sleep. At daylight, I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree about five feet from my tent. Cams that I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my stuff up as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my campsite. And when I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into and my computer and other equipment had been stolen. I am currently in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment, and too embarrassed to tell my superiors how scared I am. The Forest Service bought me a new truck, while my other one is getting the window replaced, and I did make a report about the theft, but there's no way in hell I'm ever going back to that site. And so I finally went back to retrieve my equipment and the two cams that were hanging near my site. I took a friend who's a former Marine with me and the equipment I placed was undisturbed, but the two cams that were hanging near my campsite were both missing their memory cards. I didn't tell my supervisors how scared I was, but I did say that someone had messed with the cameras and stolen the memory cards. I also requested to never be sent back to that site again. I will still work that area, but never anywhere near as remote. I truly hope it was just teenagers looking to steal and maybe have some fun at my expense. Every person I've met around here has been exceptionally nice, even if most do hate the National Forest Service. I don't know if this means I will be fired or sent to work at a desk, and out of all of the years I've been doing this in national forests around the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. And I'm not scared of animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them. But what I am scared of are people. This event happened three years ago during mid-July. I lived in Montana outside of a rural community with a population of about 2,000. During this time, I lived in a small one-floor ranch, home by myself. My nearest neighbor lived one mile away and was a farmer. I never had many strange encounters leading up to this one, but the woods by my house always had an ominous feel to it. Soon after moving in, I realized why the previous homeowners left so quickly. I'd start to hear noises in the woods. These weren't just any noises, but what sounded like blood curdling screams and growls. After some research, I learned that even something like a raccoon or bobcat can make these seemingly unnatural noises and chalked it up to it being that, but still, it never felt right. It's hard to explain, but I never felt like this before, and it was just something about the woods in my house that made me feel uncomfortable, like I was always being watched. The first experience I couldn't explain happened about two weeks after I'd moved in. 
there was a thunderstorm, and the thunder was loud enough to keep me awake. I never did feel comfortable in storms by myself. The lightning was crazy, and would light up the whole surrounding area for a fraction of a second. I was laying on the couch, and got up to get a glass and a drink at the sink. It was about 2am if I recall correctly. Above it, there's a small window that gives a view of my yard leading up to the tree line. When the next flash of lightning hits, I saw it. Admittedly, it wasn't a long view, but it gave me enough time to see whatever this thing was. It was near the tree line, just a few steps into my yard. At first, I thought it was a bear, but it wasn't. It was standing on two legs with its face pointed towards the house. Its legs were like a dog's, and I could clearly make out the hawks. It was hard to tell the colour, but the fur was dark, and its upper body was massive with a wide torso and arms that could almost reach the ground from standing. The strangest thing is how the upper body seemed to dwarf the lower body. After standing there frozen in shock, I waited for the next lightning strike, but when it happened it wasn't there. It happened so quickly, and it was gone so quickly. After that, I purchased a gun, and would sleep with it within arm's reach. The next encounter is what I consider the most frightening thing of my life. For several weeks, nothing worth noting happened. I don't get cable where I live, and one night I was watching something, and my satellite kept acting up. I didn't like going outside at night, but this would be quick. I just had to move the antenna a little bit. Nothing had happened for a few weeks, so I decided to just go out and do it. I grabbed my gun and flashlight, and went out. The first thing I noticed was the eerie quietness that surrounded me. Despite the time of year, the woods were active with all kinds of creatures, but not tonight. Despite the fear I was developing, I made my way over to the satellite and began to adjust it. I heard a small snap of a stick, and quietly turned to my left, and shined the light towards the direction of the noise. What I saw will horrify me for the rest of my life. I was immediately met with red eyes. These eyes were the colour of blood, and were evil. The head of this thing looked like a mutated German Shepherd. I don't like to say it, but it looked like a werewolf. A long snout and pointed ears. The fur was black and shaggy in some places, and I could see this creature's extremely developed musculature. And it dwarfed the largest human on earth. It was half in and half out the woods, almost crouching, and it still came to about six feet. Fully standing, this thing would have been eight feet tall. I was about twenty feet from this thing, and I didn't even consider my gun, which I brought to protect me. Chances are, in hindsight, the little... 0.223 bullets would have just annoyed this thing before it tore me to shreds. I backed away slowly, never breaking eye contact with it. I gently picked up my gun, and my fight or flight reflexes kicked in. I chose flight. Maybe not the best option, but even if I'd stayed there, this thing would kill me. I ran the fastest I'd ever ran in my life and didn't turn back once. I have no idea if it was pursuing me. I got in the house, locked every door and window, and covered the blinds, and sat with my back against the wall, cradling the gun the entire night. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night, and didn't get much for the following days. To make a long story short, I don't live there anymore. People often talk of Sasquatch being harmonious with nature, and living within the ecosystem. Sure, if you see one it might be scary, but it's probably more awe than anything. This thing 
was totally different. It felt evil. It was stalking me, toying with me, and I believe it would have killed me. I have never seen nor experienced this feeling again in my life. It is a memory I try to put past me, but I still get nightmares about it. I think until the day I die, I will always have the image burned into my memory. The best image I have seen that fits the description of the creature are the werewolves from the movie, The Howling. To preface this, I should mention that all of this took place back home on my reservation. I'm Algaquin, First Nation from Canada. Another thing I should mention is that on the res, traditional beliefs and legends of the paranormal are still a big part of our community. The attitude of most people towards the paranormal is one of assurance. To us, the paranormal is a part of regular life. We believe in a spirit world, and we believe that sometimes these beings can cross over into our world, and maybe even live among us. When I tell paranormal stories to my non-native friends, they're always in such disbelief that things like this have actually happened, and how casually I talk about it but it's only because it's been so normalized for me. Where they have absolutely no paranormal experience, I have a bunch, and most everyone I know on the res has even more than I do. I don't really care to explain it. Maybe we're all crazy from drinking our toxic tap water, Justin Trudeau. I don't know. But here's the story. This all happened in the fall of 2011 when I was 16 years old. I was living in a nearby city with my mum so that I could get a better education than the one I could get back home. But we'd go back every single weekend to see my dad and little brother. One Friday during the drive back home, I got a taxi from a friend of mine. She told me about a party that was happening that night and asked me when I'd be home so they could come pick me up and gave her a time and that was that. We get home, and as soon as we stepped inside the house, we see my dad and my cousin sitting at the kitchen table drinking some beers. They're both cops on the res. So usually beers with his partner on the Friday evening means that they've had a particularly tough week at work. Typically the toughest cases tend to deal with child abuse. They both look tired and drained, but are happy to see us. We give our greetings, catch up a little bit, and my dad asks me if I have any plans. I tell him about the party and where it'll be, and he and our cousin share a weird look. Why are you guys making that face? Did something happen? I ask. I don't know. Should we tell her? My cousin said, looking at my dad. He laughed, and they decided that I should probably know what's been going on since I'd be going to a cottage pretty deep into the woods later that evening. They start with the first strange call they got on Monday night. An older woman called saying that people were outside of her house, knocking on all of her windows. She said she couldn't see anyone, but there must have been at least three people judging by the different locations of the knocking. They arrive at the woman's house, inspected all around it, and even checked the woods, but nothing came up. They tell her that it's probably just some teenagers playing tricks on her, and that there isn't much else they can do besides patrol the area in case they return. On Wednesday night, the same woman called again with the same problems. It had rained that day, and there was mud all around this woman's home. So they figured that at the very least, they'd find footprints, but they couldn't find a thing. This is when they started feeling like something was off. Because one of the windows where the woman was adamant was being knocked was completely impossible to get to. Without, of course, stepping through this huge mud puddle. This is when they started to think that the woman was lying they just told her the same thing they'd told her a few nights prior. By Thursday night, 
everyone on the res had been talking about these strange experiences. It turns out this woman wasn't the only one experiencing the knocking. She was just the only one to call the police. I mean, all of this was taking place on a res, so it wasn't long before people were linking it to supernatural causes. My dad was still sure it was just a group of teens pranking people. But then they got another call from the same woman from the same reason. They rushed over and were met with the same situation, except this time the neighbor walked over looking pale as a ghost. Is this about the knocking? And they notice he's a little shaky. Yeah. Did you see something? The man nodded and said, you guys gonna think I'm crazy. But he goes on to explain what he saw. He said that he had stepped outside for a cigarette on his front porch when he heard knocking. He looked around to see where it was coming from. And when he looked to his neighbor's house, he saw it. There was a black figure standing outside the woman's window. The same one with the mud puddle that I mentioned, looking into her home. He said it looked humanoid in stature, but completely made from shadow. You could tell it was something solid-ish, but you couldn't make out any features on it. He stared at it completely in shock, and watched the thing as it knocked a few more times, and then darted around the house knocking on every single window. He said it moved too fast to be human. It was practically a blur. It went around the house a few times, then ran across the road into the tree line behind one tree in particular. The man was frozen. He couldn't look away. It then leaned out from behind the tree staring directly at him, with yellow eyes that reflected the light, similarly to a cat's. And then, it smiled showing numerous pointed and sharp teeth. I almost crapped myself, he said, attempting to joke, but his voice was still shaking. Fast forward to Friday. Stories are being exchanged all over the res about other sightings and experiences people were having. On top of multiple people experiencing the knocking, there were also quite a few sightings with everyone describing this creature in the same way. One woman was bringing her trash bin to the road when she thought she saw someone in her peripheral vision standing near the trees. She walked back up the driveway and into her home, feeling like she was being watched. Right before she was about to open her door to go back inside her home, she looked back and saw two reflective yellow eyes watching her from the trees. She said it was about five feet above the ground. Another couple were driving at night, and they saw a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. As they got closer, they slowed down, and it turned around to face them. That is when they saw the reflective yellow eyes and sharp teeth, and it smiled at them. They stopped the car, too afraid to get any closer to it until they decided to just drive past it. Being on a narrow road, they drove past it with the figure being only a few feet from the windows, staring at them the whole time. You sure you still want to go to the party? My dad asks. But my friends were already pulling into the driveway. I gave my family hugs and kisses goodbye, and they told me to be careful. But I felt fine. A common belief among native people is that negative energy attracts negative energy. Therefore, an evil spirit will be drawn to people with unresolved issues, traumas, and sinners, I suppose. If you're someone who is spiritual, self-aware, and basically a good person, that, in of itself, will be protective. I get to the party. And within 20 minutes, the conversation shift towards all the paranormal experiences that people have been having. I'm really curious about what everyone has to say, because they have stories that I hadn't heard yet. But my friend, us being 16 and all, couldn't hold her alcohol very well, and was crying about how she wishes she was closer with her brother. 
I was trying to make her feel better while listening to everyone's stories. One of the people at the party was related to the neighbour of the woman who was calling the police. The experience really shook him and my friend, and was just explaining everything that he was doing later on. For one, he smudged his entire home, which is something our people do when we're looking for extra protection against paranormal entities. He also went to visit multiple elders around the community, asking for advice and any information they had on similar happenings. What we do know about paranormal experiences on the res is that they don't happen as often as they used to. If you talk to one of our elders, they have endless stories and even more advice to give on about how to protect yourself compared to now. One of the explanations that was given to this guy about the shadow thing was that it was evidence that someone was doing an unauthorized shaking tent ceremony. If you don't know what it is, you can look it up. But it's basically, and I'm generalizing here, like a Ouija board session that takes place inside a tent. People stand around the tent while the medicine man or medicine woman goes inside and asks questions. A tent begins to shake and you can hear the voices of spirits coming through. I've personally never been to one because we haven't had a good enough reason to make one. But typically our ancestors used shaking tent ceremonies when we were starving in the dead of winter and needed some direction on where the nearest food source was. My mum's been to one and her story is absolutely crazy. She described multiple voices of men and women only speaking the native tongue and they were upset that the people were doing a shaking tent ceremony when they weren't on the verge of death. The people there had to explain that they were only doing it to prove that it was real, as we had been losing our culture as a result of residential schools. But the spirits were angry, saying that the bridge between the two worlds should never be opened unless absolutely necessary, because you don't know who you're communicating with. It could be evil spirits and it could be good ones. It could be our ancestors, but you never know. Anyway. The elders told him that the spirit crossed over into our world because of a shaking tent ceremony. Someone on the reserve had been doing them without consulting the elders. So we started talking about who would do that without proper guidance and without good enough reason to do so. Then one of the drunkest dudes at this point starts saying stuff like, eh, I'm not scared. That thing could show up now and it wouldn't do anything. Basically egging an evil spirit. All of us were looking at each other like, why would you disrespect it? That's exactly how it will attract to you. And that's when I decided to leave the sun room where everyone was and went to the living room to console my drunk and crying friend. That's when I noticed that the rocking chair outside on the porch was going back and forth by itself. I looked away immediately, refusing to make eye contact, but I did look from my peripheral vision. I'm inside the cottage and keep seeing this rocking chair going back and forth. But another thing that we're raised to do in our culture is to ignore paranormal experiences. Spirits feed on the energy that people put towards them. So if you freak out, if you get angry, if you yell at it or start to cry, that is exactly what it wants. And it will stick around once it gets a reaction. It thrives on energy of any kind. So while I knew something was messed up with that rocking chair, I wasn't about to pay it any attention. Five minutes or so go by and I can still see it moving out of the corner of my eye. That's when my friend screams and she runs to the other side of the sunroom. My other friends sprint to where the girl was sitting and bust through the French doors onto the balcony. All of this is happening in a split second, but I immediately go to the patio and ask what's going on. The girl is still crying on the couch with friends all around her. She claims to have seen the spirit, which we later nicknamed Kokoji, which is Algaquin for monster. She said she was listening to the boys talk about the spirit when she saw the boy's face as he was looking out on the balcony behind her. She turned around to see what he was looking at, 
and directly on the other side of the window was the shadow spirit sitting on the rocking chair, smiling at her, literally three feet from her. That's when the boy sprints towards it and busts through the French doors. I walk out to find the boy on the lawn staring into the woods. I call his name and he looks up at me and tells me to get everyone inside. The tone of his voice makes me automatically obey and I get all the drunk teenagers in the cottage. This is when the phase, come at me bro, was just gaining popularity. So you could imagine yelling that into the woods was a terrible idea. I eventually get everyone inside and my friend who's a girl isn't crying anymore, but she's visibly shaken from the experience. The guy comes back inside, tells everyone to clean up and that we should all leave ASAP. Everyone has trash bags and are clearing away all the beer bottles and cans and everyone goes into the cottage and it's only me and the boy in the sunroom now. I look at him for answers and all he says is, it's outside. I nod and start cleaning faster. The sooner we're out of here, the sooner we're away from that thing. As we're cleaning in the sunroom, we hear knocking on the windows in multiple places. The entire sunroom is made of glass, but it's dark out, so you can't even see outside. I immediately look to the boy and he just says, ignore it. Within two seconds, someone comes running out the bathroom and says, I'll kill whoever's knocking outside on the bathroom window. But everyone's accounted for. And someone else comes running out the bedroom saying there was knocking on the window in there as well. Now everyone's freaking out and me and the boy and our one other friend are the only sober ones to calm everyone down. We get the place clean and get out to the cars immediately. Everyone's getting into the trucks and I'm standing with the boy while he's relaxed. When all of a sudden he looks behind me and shoves me inside his truck. We peel out the driveway and drop everyone off. A few days later, I ended up hanging out with this kid and he tells me the story from his perspective. He said that when the boys started talking crap about the spirit, it appeared on the rocking chair behind my friend. He said he made eye contact with it and couldn't look away. They were staring each other down and that is when my friend, the one who was crying, saw that boy's expression and he said it was instinct to defend the people who were with him and he ran towards it. He said that the feeling he was getting from the Kokoji was almost like it was daring him to do something. He said the second he got up, it stood and ran into the woods, disappearing from the patio in a blur. So he ran to the porch and was looking around the lawn when he saw it standing in the tree line looking right at him with an evil grimace on its face. He said the whole time he felt like it was mocking him. I called his name and it disappeared. He didn't see it again until everyone was getting into the truck, which explained why he suddenly pushed me inside. He said it was standing on the far end of the truck very close to us. And later that night when he dropped everyone off, they realized that they never locked the doors. So he went back to the cottage but his friend, whose cottage it was, was too scared to go in. So my friend goes in by himself. But the second he opens the door, he sees this thing standing in the living room and he locks the doors as quickly as he can and peels out the driveway. Sightings continued for a few days after that. We definitely weren't the only people on the res to have experiences like this. And then it stopped all of a sudden by itself. It was the talk of the res, and everyone was curious about what happened to it. Would it come back? What was it? But word ended up getting around that there were sightings north of our community. White people in the town just north of us were having sightings, and then the other reservations were having sightings too. It was like it was traveling north, the way the stories were going anyway. It's 2018 now and no one else on my res has had any sightings of this particular thing. Let's hope it stays that way. 
I had something very bizarre and scary happen the other day. My wife and I were taking our dog out for a run. Call me weird, but one of the most beautiful spots in our small town is the cemetery. We take her there once a week to run around the area. Don't worry, she doesn't run on graves or anything like that. So everything's going well. We get there, let the dog out, and go park in our usual spot. She comes running back very fast, and I can tell she seems spooked. Odd, but okay. Because she always wants to run to every tree and smell it. It's normally a pain in the ass to get her ready to leave, so we figured we should head out and find a different spot to let her run. On our way out, we see an oddly shaped rock on top of the ridge just outside the cemetery. My wife stopped the car so we could get a better look. Something felt odd, so my wife gives out a little whistle to confirm it was nothing, and it lifts its head. She whistles once more, a little louder than the first time, and it turns to look at us. This person or whatever it seemed to be at that moment, just sat there with its head cocked in our direction. The face, no joke, looked like a dog. A big, brown dog with a very large, long snout. Yet this dog had arms and looked like it was using a smartphone. This overwhelming sense of fear comes over me, and I tell my wife to drive and to get out of there as fast as possible. I swear on my life, I've seen it with my own eyes. It's crazy the fear you feel when you see something you simply cannot explain. I plan on going back there on my days off to see if I can find some evidence. This happened last year in Virginia and is also the reason why I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time and we ended up with a three day weekend in June. So I thought it would be a great time to go and explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search and found a state park with a trail that looked nice and let my roommate and family know the trail that I was going to be going on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stopped. I went in to grab a map of the area in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and parents about the new trail and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days, two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them were really fun to talk to. As expected, as I got further and further from the main trails, I saw less and less people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even wind, and I had a feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in. So naturally, I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. It was Chill Bill because it was stuck in my head. And that's when I heard something whistling the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me. So I went back and forth with it, and it repeated everything I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched again, and I would get goosebumps and my hairs would stand on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make dinner, 
as I did this, because I became hyper aware that again there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I'm not safe to leave, and I ignored it, and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I awoke the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found, my bear bag with my food was cut down, and the contents were thrown around the site. My first thought was a crafty animal chewed through the rope and got to the bag. But when I looked at the rope, it was cut with something very sharp, and none of the food was touched. I also noticed bare footprints all around my campsite, and keep in mind I'm at least six to eight miles from a road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction, and I saw nothing, but I heard that whistling again, my whistle from yesterday. But it was different, more sinister, and made my hair stand on end. And that's when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, the whistling getting ever closer as I finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't bother putting anything away properly. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with the whistling, stood up and yelled into the woods, shut up, what do you want? It stopped, it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated what I said in my voice. It sounded just like me, it distorted like it came from an old TV. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I came. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but not being too far. Eventually it sounded like it got further and further away from me, and then it stopped all of a sudden. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around, and I wished I hadn't, because I heard the most bone-chilling screeching ever coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I only ran. Less than a half mile I ran into a couple that were also backpacking. They saw the look of terror in my face, and asked me if it were me that screamed and if I was okay. I told them what happened, and they decided to not go down where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail as quickly as we could, and as soon as I got back into my car, I drove to one of the park ranger stations and reported what happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they will send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station parking lot run right up to the woods where I was getting into my jeep, and I heard the chill bill tune coming from the woods just in front of me. I never drove so fast in my life. When I told my roommate why I was only there for one night, all he said to me in reply was, Bro, I'm never going camping with you. This happened around 1920 to 1930. My late great grandfather was in Tennessee hunting for raccoons at night with his buddy. He was armed with a double barrel that is currently still in my grandfather's possession, and his buddy had a 22. They also brought two dogs with them. They were deep into a trail along a fence when they heard a crunch above them. Thank God. They look up to see a large black animal, seven feet long with a tail, watching them from the tree. It's silent. And my great grandfather's buddy filed a single shot at the creature, and it completely tanked it, jumped down about 15 feet, and went berserk. The description my great grandfather gave was that it had the jaws of a dog, and it looked strong enough to lift a 14 pound dog off the ground and kill it with a chomp. 
a 12 gauge round to the shoulder slowed it down, but not for long. It swipes the other dog, killing it almost instantly. His friend tries to run, but the animal swipes at him, hardly nicking his back and tearing his shirt half off his body. My great grandfather fires his last shot into the animal's stomach and throws down his gun. The animal has most of his attention on his buddy, who is holding a lantern out in front of him and is growling like nothing he's heard before. My great grandfather takes this chance to yank a fence post out of the ground and beat the animal. He clubs it over the head and spine killing it for a few strong hits. It whimpered like a dog. After a better examination, they describe the animal as having a big wolf's head, big old paws with claws like a bear, and a skinny but strong body. It had long black hair and a long tail like a puma. They abandoned the hunt and gut the animal so they can drag the body about two miles back to the cabin where my great grandfather lived. This is where the story gets weird. Apparently they take it to a guy with a scientific background in zoology. The man eventually gets back to them, telling them to stay out the forest at night, with no explanation about what the animal was. This story was retold to me by my grandfather, so some things might be twisted by memory, but my grandfather swears full truth on his part. One more important detail about the story is my great grandfather's position on the identity of the animal. Him and his body, along with my great grandmother who had seen the body, are adamant on the fact that this was not a bear or a panther, and the head was just like a wolf's. That's the part that gets me. Bears and predatory cats use claws a lot, but wolves not so much, but they are sure it had a wolf-like head. This happened a little over two years ago. I'm a 31 year old male, five foot 11, and was pretty athletic in shape at the time. I worked out, went running, and ate right. The city I live in has about 300,000 people. There are tons of parks and forests with hiking trails all throughout the city itself and the city is pretty much surrounded by woods and farmland past that. It was fall time during the year, and occasionally, on my days off from work, I like to load up my backpack, just grab my stuff for a kind of urban hike, and take off walking across the city, hiking through a bunch of different trails and parks along the way, stopping and grabbing coffees at cafes, beer at pubs, and doing whatever just floated my boat. Those were the days. Sometimes I would take my dog with me too, but on this particular day I had taken off and left them at home. I remember loading up my backpack as usual. Sometimes I would take my dogs with me too, but on this particular day I had taken off and left them at home. I remember loading up my backpack as usual rolling a couple of joints up to take for the journey, and getting ready for leaving. For the entire week, it had been raining non-stop, and with it being so late in the year, somewhere around October, it made it pretty cold outside, even though there wasn't snow on the ground yet. I put on my winter jacket and hat, but still kept on my hiking, athletic type shoes instead of any kind of boot and I had already walked across most of the entire length of the city into the side where it would be the town exactly opposite from where I live. This area is not especially nice, but I've never had any problems or bad experiences myself, even living in the area for a few years beforehand. On the very edge of this place is a big nature conservatory that basically runs along the outer edge of the city. So I start hiking in this area of trails, after maybe 10 to 15 minutes of hiking, 
and I decide to blaze up one of my smokes. I walk along listening to jazz through my headphones when I finally finish my joint. I've seen no one else out at this point, which is expected as it's a bit damp and cold. But after maybe five minutes from finishing up my smoke, I turn around a bend of trees and see another guy walking down the same trail as myself. It's maybe 45 seconds until we pass each other. I turn down my music and get a good look at this guy. He looked homeless, which isn't too uncommon in this area. But he had mostly grey hair with still some spots of brown, but dramatically thinning even though it ran down to his shoulders, and a patchy beard that was coloured the same. He had a green type jacket on and some dirty jeans, just looking like a dirty alcoholic and rather unpleasant in general. But who am I to judge? The guy looks annoyed, and as we're getting closer to each other, even though I'm looking directly at him, he never makes eye contact with me the whole time. He looks like he's almost mumbling or pouting or saying something under his breath. But as we finally pass each other, he still doesn't acknowledge me. So I didn't feel the need to say anything either, and just kept going my way. I don't really think too much about it, and continue walking. But before he turns around, the bend of trees that I had just come from, I turn my head back towards his direction and take a look at him, only to see him doing the same to me already, as he's still walking. Our eyes connect, and I don't break eye contact even though we're about 40 yards away from each other now. I'm just kind of like, hmm, weird, as I continue to walk and turn my music back up. The more I think about him, the more I weird myself out. But then I tell myself that I'm being paranoid because I'm high, and continue to go about my business. I'm hiking along for about another 10 minutes or so, listening to jazz really loudly in my headphones, packed underneath my thick winter cap, when I'm walking along a part of the path and trail, where it's a little steeper of a decline off to my right about a little 10 foot muddy hill type drop. I remember listening to John Coltrane, so the songs are really long. And it was just by luck that a song had just ended. And there were a brief few seconds of silence before the next song played. When all of a sudden I heard footsteps running behind me. I span around to my left as fast as possible, when the guy from before was directly on top of me. What happened next seemed like it all happened in a matter of seconds, but just fortunately, it seemed like I was in the zone when it occurred. As I spun around to my left turning around, the man was there immediately. I basically grabbed him by the shoulder with one arm and his coat with the other, and we both go over the edge of the trail down the slope. I remember rolling down the slope completely twice on my shoulder, still backpacking everything on and somehow landed on my knees and was able to get into a sprinter's position and run right out on the landing. Already running at full speed by the time even got back up, I didn't even hesitate and look back as I bolted in a straight line through everything. At first, landing and running, I was maybe 15 yards away when I heard the man yell twice to stop. The area that we had fallen down into was basically a muddy wet marsh after all the rain. I didn't look back once. I was sprinting as fast as I could for about 10 to 15 minutes before I ran into a chain link fence separating someone's backyard from the nature preserve. I hopped in and kept running three to four blocks back into a residential area and further away from the wooded one. Finally, I stopped and caught my breath before I called up a buddy who lived nearby and had him come and collect me. After we got back to his place, I explained what happened, and he pointed out the shoulder and backpack of my jacket were completely ripped from the top, almost as if he could have had a knife and just cut my jacket as I turned around at the last second, 
or it could have been when I rolled down the hill too. I don't know. Either way, I hope to never see that psycho or experience anything similar to this again. I am experienced in the outdoors. I'm a hunter, hiker, and camper. I don't usually spook too easily because I basically grew up with a gun in one hand, a fishing pole in the other, and maybe a magnesium fire starter hidden somewhere special, as well as a knife. I always have a knife. I hunt in a town not too far north of Millie Lax Lake. One season I was fairly deep in the woods on a snowmobile trail. When I hunt, I typically carry my .30 to .06, and my knife and pack. I feel fairly confident in the woods, but this season I had some concern. The deer population seemed lower on our property recently, and we knew that there were wolves around because you can hear them howl at night and have found tracks but they typically don't mess with people luckily. But as I was scanning for deer tracks in the dirt, I found a different set of tracks that stood out to me. It looked canine minus the nail marks, which were a bit wider. The paw on it looked like an animal of 150 pounds. Then it clicked that this was a feline track, a big one and fairly fresh. I knew there were bobcats around, but they don't get that big. And the next logical step is to assume that there's a cougar. Now I decided to double back. So I'm heading back east on the trail, and my dad calls and asks me to push through the woods towards his stand. So I say sure. At this point his stand is perhaps 500 meters through thick woods for me, and I'm concerned about predators. But I also know that I'm 6 foot 4, 190 pounds, and that's before putting on my gear, and that statistically speaking, cougars don't tend to attack healthy adult men. So I push forward. I get about halfway to the other stand and get concerned because I lost my marker. So I stop to regain my bearing when it hits me. My gut tells me that I'm being watched. Then I notice how still the woods are. It's very quiet and I hear a branch snap behind me, maybe 20 meters. I ready my rifle and scan in a circle, and only see trees and brush. I wait, and it's just quiet. So I push forwards towards my dad's stand, and I think the whole time that I hear something not far behind me, quietly keeping pace. Eventually I stopped hearing it, and the woods returned to normal with birdsong and whatnot. Then I stepped out onto a trail about 40 meters from my dad's stand. I suspected it was the cougar that made the tracks. My guess is that they thought it would be too much of a fight, or it caught wind of my dad and chose to back off. But I never did see it. But something was definitely following me. This story is the second one, and happened two years ago. I decided to take my fiance hiking after work one evening, in a park with some nice bluffs to climb for a great view. I was hoping to see a pretty sunset. Now this isn't a particularly safe thing to do at this time of night, so I gave her my tactical knife, and I carried my .40 caliber pistol. So we arrived and parked the car, and started heading up a trail. About a hundred meters in, we spook and jump, what I thought was a deer. It hauled us away from us so quickly that I only saw a flash of tan and maybe its flag. And honestly, it scared us pretty good too. So now I'm on edge and we round a crest in a hill and I see a black mass to my left peripheral vision. I unsnap the retention on my holster and turn to engage. A mound of dirt black, and now I calm down, and we continue as it's a nice evening. The birds are still chirping, bugs are making noises, and it's regular forest stuff. We get about 200 meters 
from the halfway point on the trail, and it starts to feel eerie, like we're being watched. This time, it clicked right away. The woods are now dead, but I start noticing movement keeping pace with us, so I keep us moving towards the top of the hill, to the high ground, which is the halfway point on the trail. We reach it, and it stops, but the woods are still dead calm, and my fiancé tells me she thinks we're being followed. So we decide to move on and take a shortcut back down the bluff to the paved trail. We make it, and the woods go back to normal. We considered hiking more, but we were a bit too spooked and left the park. Now whatever was following us I suspect was another cougar. It was quiet, and we didn't see it. And the strangest part is that the stalking noises it did made sounded elevated, like it was moving from tree to tree. And big cats have been known to do this. I was going through a tough time and just wanted to be alone. We have a woods besides our house, so I decided to ride my dirt bike out there at night, sit by the fire, and just chill with some music. About an hour or so later, I wanted to change up the music, so I grabbed my iPod and started to surf through some songs until I found something that I liked. Now, I forgot to mention it, but at night the woods are pitch black out there, even with a fire, so you can only see a few feet around you. Basically, you and the fire are the only ones around in a sea of darkness. I switched songs and turned back to the fire. I froze. On the other side of the fire, a large form with pointed ears loomed in the darkness. The only reason I noticed it was because of the glowing eyes reflecting the flames that burned between us. This thing was huge. I'm about six feet tall, and it was taller than I was. I stood there paralyzed in fear, as for what seemed like minutes stretched between us, only the music breaking the dead silence. Now I live in Ohio, so there aren't a whole lot of tall animals with pointy ears in the woods. We have no bears of any kind or wild animals in the area that are bigger than a deer. The thing before me was definitely no deer. And at the moment, I didn't think it was human either. During our silent standoff, my brain finally recovered from shock and screamed for me to move. I quickly dropped everything in my hands, including my phone and iPod. I jumped on my dirt bike and tried to start it. And just like in the horror movies, it wouldn't start. Dread filled me and I could feel my face pale. The engine turned over really slow, as if the battery was dead. I thought my heart would break my ribs, it was pounding so hard. Luckily it has a kickstarter as a backup, though I've never had any luck kickstarting it. I guess luck was smiling down on me that night, because with a hard kick, it started, and I flew through the woods as fast as I could. Looking back on it now, I'm guessing whatever it was could have attacked me at the same time. I don't know if it had already left during my panicked escape, or if it was still watching me with those fiery eyes as I fled. Once I got up to the house, I told my parents about what happened, and asked my dad to go back with me to grab my phone and iPod. However, it was really late, so he declined, and I guess he didn't believe me. Now don't ask me why I would go back after escaping with my life, but I really wanted my stuff. I ended up calling my friend who lives nearby, and he agreed to come to my assistance. My friend and I went back out into the woods with, and I kid you not, swords and a disposable camera to get my stuff. I took the camera with us just in case I would be fortunate enough to snap a picture of whatever was out there with me. As I was snapping pics in one hand, then holding a sword in the other, we approached the site and gathered my things. The thing was nowhere in sight. As we were walking back up to my house, 
we noticed the neighbouring house was lit up. However, it wasn't house lights. It was on fire. We dialed 911 and ended up finding out it was an abandoned house that caught fire. Now I'm not sure if it had anything to do with what I saw, but it sure was weird to have happened all in one night around the same time. Until this day, I have no idea what animal would be taller than me and would approach a fire and music. Not sure if it was some kind of weird creature or possibly a person in a mask. I still have the disposable camera sitting on my desk. I haven't gotten around to getting them developed, but I think that maybe I should. A lot of time has passed and I still occasionally do go out into the woods, but I can't help but wonder if the thing is still out there watching me. These are some of the strange experiences from a camping trip in Northern Ontario. I went on these back when I was a little kid with my dad and stepmom. I want to preface this by saying that despite the things that I'm going to talk about, it was still a good experience. My parents split amicably when I was very young and didn't actually live with my dad. I still got to see him though, and these kind of trips were a bonding experience and were always pretty fun. I just don't want this story to overshadow that. Anyway, my dad and stepmom rented a tiny cabin in Northern Ontario one summer through a family friend. I don't know exactly where it was, but I am certain it was well north of Midland, which is the regular cottage country for Toronto folk. The cabin was on a lake and the owners ferried us there on a tiny motorboat. This wasn't an island, mind you. I think there just weren't many roads to access it. Some strange things happened on this trip. Let's start at the beginning. The owner had left a canoe at the cabin, and we took it out on a lot of trips on the lake, usually later in the day. I was obsessed with frogs and fish and wildlife as a kid, and this lake was loaded with marshes, so I loved these outings. I remember one in particular. It was almost sunset, and we were heading back through one of the marshes, and I heard a faint humming similar to a transformer coming from the tree line on the shore. My dad slash stepmom noticed it too as it grew louder. It stopped all of a sudden a few moments later, but so did everything else. The sound of birds and frogs croaking and other wildlife had completely dropped off and stayed silent. Nothing else strange happened on our way back, but it was creepy as hell. The cabin was on the shoreline, but there wasn't a beach or anything close to one. It was actually a very steep and rocky shore around the entire area. But once you got into the water, there was sand. Mussels and crayfish thrived in here, and my dad got the idea to catch some for cooking. Freshwater mussels taste terrible, by the way. Don't try it. My dad isn't a woodsman by any means, but he is very crafty and very resourceful. We canoed to a sandy area close to the shore and waded out to catch mussels. On both sides of the water here, the shore was very steep rocks, like two floors up, with thick forest at the top. At some point during our escapade, I caught a glimpse of something among the tree line opposite the shore. I couldn't make it out very well, but it was white, almost like the texture of birch, and very lanky. I remember thinking that it was definitely not a person, but it wasn't too far from the general shape of one. It was staggering around lethargically and very slowly. If it was an animal, then something was definitely wrong with it. I waded over to my dad and told him to look up there. And by that point, it was gone. Because of this, I'm still not 100% sure it isn't something I imagined. But I remember seeing it again on the opposite shore on our way back. This next part is from my dad's perspective as he told it to me. 
on one of our canoe outings, he and my stepmom decided to visit this little peninsula on the other side of the lake close to the marshes area. We all got there and dragged the canoe onto what little shoreline there was, and walked inland single file. There wasn't a patch, but the trees weren't particularly dense either, enough to see the water when you looked back. Pretty soon, he noticed that the entire place was covered in mushrooms, and live trees had given way to down slash dead trees further inland. This was unnatural, because it didn't look like there had been a forest fire or anything. They were just dead. It also started smelling really, really bad. Not wanting to endanger themselves by going further, they turned back. He didn't want to let on that he was nervous, but told me that it seriously freaked him out, and we stayed clear of that peninsula for the rest of the trip. This is something my dad told me happened to him during this trip a few years ago. He went hiking by himself at some point, and when he was deeper into the woods, everything around him just stopped. No sound whatsoever, no movement, no wind or leaves falling. It all returned a minute or so later, and nothing else eventful happened for the rest of his hike. We also spent most nights having fires outside, and one night, my dad and I stayed up watching X-Files on his tiny black and white TV. I'm actually not sure how this place even had power, since it wasn't accessible by road. Maybe it had a generator, or even a small PV battery set up for all I know. There wasn't much other than a few lights, that TV, and a small water pump to the lake. Anyway, I was young, and X-Files was spooky as hell for me. During one of the episodes, we both heard that humming coming from outside, like when we were on the canoe. It was faint, but definitely there. We went outside with a flashlight to see if we could identify it, but couldn't see anything. We didn't want to go into the woods this late, or take the canoe out, and it sounded like it was far away enough, so we went back in. It was intermittent throughout the rest of the night, sometimes getting louder, sometimes quieting down. In the morning, our water wasn't working. My dad went to investigate, and apparently the pump power cabling had been messed with. It was an easy fix, but strange nonetheless. This next one is probably the most unsettling one that I remember. I'd wake up earlier than everyone else most mornings, because I was pretty hyped to go out and catch toads and frogs and whatever else I could find. I even set a trap for a chipmunk one time, and successfully caught it. I remember one morning, I had woken up just before sunrise and was still in bed. In the window adjacent to my bed, I saw something that usually wasn't there. It was half a face poking around the edge of the window and staring into our cabin. Sickly pale orange with giant black holes where the eyes were supposed to be. This thing was definitely not human. I flipped out, hid under the covers and eventually fell back to sleep. When I awoke again, everyone was also awake, and there was no sign of anything there. I've always thought of this particular example as something that I have just imagined after waking up. Although about a month ago, I met up with my dad while visiting my home city, and we got talking about this trip again. He mentioned that there were quite a few times when he felt uneasy. For example, my dad usually goes jogging early in the mornings for exercise. It's a habit he still keeps up to this day. He decided to abstain a couple of mornings at that cabin though, because there was something which he couldn't quite place that was creeping him the hell out. I only connected this with the window incident after our conversation, but when I did it, it really made me think about the entire trip, and is the one reason I decided to share this. I can't undeniably prove any of what happened, but for what it's worth, I don't talk about this stuff often, unless it's true.
Corbett National Park in India. We had just spent four rainy, disappointing days in the company of mud spattered jeeps, spotted deer, noisy wild chickens, and bland ramen. Tomorrow would be our last day. It was a full moon night. My friend and I were chilling at the edge of our camp, located just above a broad, rocky riverbed. We had to leave early the next morning. So the rest of our party had gone to bed, or were doing shots and playing cards in the tent. The couple were still hanging out by the embers of the dying campfire. My friend and I thought it best to head down to the riverbed to smoke our cigarettes. Things were peaceful, and we made our way through half a pack. I was busy reclining on a rock and contemplating the stars when I suddenly felt my friend grasp my sleeve. I raised my head. He didn't need to point. I could see it too. It wasn't far away. In fact, it was close. A tiger. A fully grown tiger. Separated from us by a bed of pebbles, a few rocks, and a shallow two-foot stream. Not more than ten meters away. Except... It was completely blue, and it was standing up on its hind legs, front paws lifted in an embrace of something invisible. I still remember the gleam in its eyes, one orange, one green. It was looking right at us. It was also frozen, absolutely still as a statue. Not a roar, not a purr, nothing. Like one of those dioramas of a saber-toothed tiger you find in museums. One of our guides had warned us about a blue tiger that prowled around on full moon nights, looking for lost people to eat. We had welcomed the story as one of those fun touristy things when it was first told to us, but not to be taken seriously. But there it was, right in front of us. Fear did not take a hold of me yet. I did go light-headed within seconds, though, and started to think of my family. I'm wondering what they would be doing right now. My friend's presence was oddly reassuring, because I kept thinking fiercely over and over in my head. I'm not lost. I'm not lost. It knows I'm not lost. It can't eat me. Look, I'm not alone. I realized I was pleading with the universe. Somewhere far, far away, I heard my friend say very, very calmly, pick up the stubs. Don't leave them there. I vaguely remember obeying him. And then when I turned away from the frozen tiger, took it out of my vision, both direct and peripheral, the fear washed over me like a tidal wave. Goosebumps erupted across my shoulders and back, and I screamed. My friend and I ran like we had never run, yelling, leaping, and bounding over rocks, and scrambling up the embankment like cartoons. I was so sure that at any moment, the tiger would pounce on me. I vividly remember my heart pounding in my ear and thinking of the raptors in the tall grass in Jurassic Park too. We did not stop running until we had raced past the now fizzled campfire and reached the reception area, where there were still a few people up and about. Needless to say, when we went back, to take a look 15 minutes later from the embankment, as there was no way in hell we were going down to the riverbed again, with flashlights and 10 other campers that we had managed to rouse, the tiger was gone. We told the others our story all next morning. It wasn't like they didn't believe us. They believed we saw something, just not a blue tiger. They thought it was the moonlight playing tricks on us, while others thought that we were high. On top of that, the guide who had warned us about the tiger was behaving very shifty and smug all morning, as if he knew what was going on. A couple of people joked that maybe he had thrown on a costume and we'd fallen for it. Ugh, it wasn't like that. There was something unnatural, something unearthly about what we had seen on the riverbed. I knew it. My friend knew it. And between the two of us, we knew that we would be the only ones who knew what we had seen. 
That experience changed the way I viewed a lot of things. I am no longer skeptical about religion and the paranormal. I do believe there are things in this world we maybe never are going to be able to understand or comprehend. It is a peaceful place to be in. But my most immediate takeaway and my biggest piece of advice to you, don't mess around in the wilderness. Respect the rules, but you have no idea what is waiting for you there. I grew up in rural Arkansas. I also grew up during a time when lots of family farms were caving into the pressure of big agricultural industries and selling off loads of farmland and forest acreage to massive companies that wanted to develop our little area into a mega feedlot, which has largely happened. When I was in ninth or 10th grade, that new clear-cut style of agricultural development finally made its way within a few miles of our house, and it was awful. We didn't have any close neighbours, and we were the only house on our route for probably 10 miles in either direction. So it felt very violating to have this development slowly work its way up our road to our house over the course of a few years. But once spring arrived, those new clear-cut expanses exploded into fields of tall grasses and brambles, and fireflies loved them. Our place is along one of those several bayous that converges into a wide, mossy wetland. So mid-spring nights are full of light fog that hugs the ground as it rolls away from the wet ground and out into the surrounding forest and the clear-cut fields that replaced it. Driving home with my friend Patrick one night, we come into a screeching halt on the road as it passes by the border of this new, foggy, endless grass field. I've never seen so many fireflies in a single congregation in my life. There must have been millions. And it was truly gorgeous. They would sync up in small groups flashing in unison. Then those harmonies would break up and come back together, and so on and so forth. We watched them from the hood of the car for a while, and eventually decided we had to go out and walk into the field to see the light show from the inside. It was an amazing experience walking through them, and we walked for probably a good two kilometers to about the midpoint of this particular clear cut. Grasses were damp, and about mid-chest tall, and the fog was around the same height, rolling in from the east, which is the direction of the bayou, and still thin enough to see through. We freeze for a moment, when we see the grass top swaying a bit up ahead, but calm down when we realise it looks like a raccoon or armadillo, or something like that, is walking around, and we just see it rustling. Quickly though, we can see the top of the animal doing it. The flat back, peeking through the grass top, now when again. What is that? A huge dog? Surely not. What dog is four and a half feet tall, and it hasn't got its head popped up over the grass looking where it's going? Is it still possible? <laughs> Maybe it's a deer, heading down and grazing. It's too far away to really tell, and perhaps a hundred yards from us, and there's just not enough available moonlight to see the details properly. At this point, we get a little nervous about startling an animal. So we move closer together, and I clear my throat to make some audible, non-threatening noises. The motion comes to a total stop again. No head pops up to see what the noise was, which we find totally freaky and uncomfortable. I feel Pat touch my back like a quiet nudge, and I take it to mean we should quietly go back to the car. As soon as we start moving a bit, the dog, or whatever it is, stands up, and it's clearly human-sized, with a head full of long hair. We didn't see any clothes and didn't see anything, 
other than it's now moving towards us, quickly, and at a good pace. Needless to say, we are now running. We run for 15 minutes or so, and by that time, we make it to the roadside without making a peep or turning around, because we are both absolutely petrified. We jump in the car, slap the locks closed, and then look back into the field. But nothing is visible. We ride home breathlessly, and basically talk about it over and over to ourselves again and again for weeks. I have no paranormal inclinations, but what would a naked long-haired person be doing rummaging around on all fours in the middle of nowhere Arkansas, where there is precisely one road and one house in a 15 mile radius? Was it some crazy person living in the wilderness? That thought scares me more since we spent so much time in tents and deer stands out there over the years. At the time, it made me think about Pet Cemetery. It still freaks me out going to that place at night when I visit my parents. From roughly 2000 to 2005, I lived on the South Edge on Northern Virginia. This was a rural area with houses set far apart from each other, surrounded by fairly dense woods. There was a phenomenon that I came to call the Woodwalkers. Due to insomnia, I had a bad tendency to stay up very late at night, sometimes all the way until dawn. Frequently I'd leave the window partially open all night long, in order to let a cool breeze in. On some occasions late at night, well after midnight, I'd hear something loudly crashing through the woods behind the house. It always sounded like a large man staggering drunkenly through the woods, always along the same path from the direction of the driveway down towards the Bull Run River. The leaves would be rustling very loudly, as if a large person were carelessly dragging their feet along the ground. Branches would be snapping, as if the person was lurching blindly through the forest. I couldn't tell if it was one person or several people, but the passing through the woods always created an alarming amount of noise. I came to expect to hear the woodwalkers every two weeks or so. And after a while, whenever I heard the noise of woodwalkers, I would peer out the window trying to discern who or what was making all the noise at such a late hour. I never saw a thing, no outlines of figures, and no glow from a flashlight. The really strange thing about this to me is that the apparent path they were traversing through came from nowhere and went nowhere. They just stumbled through the woods, apparently tearing their own path through the wilderness, going deeper into the woods. It's also bizarre that they would go crashing through the deep dark woods at 2am or 3am when it's pitch black without using a light source. It seems impossible to me that anyone could find their way through the woods in the dark like that. On one particular occasion, I heard the woodwalkers behind the house. Then I heard a branch of gunshots from directly behind it. It sounded like a handgun to me. And the next morning I wandered around the edge of my yard searching for expended brass, but didn't find anything. I found no trace or signs of anyone passing through the woods. In the days after the gunshots, I became increasingly determined to solve the strange mystery of the woodwalkers. I put a flashlight on a small dresser by my door. I patiently waited night after night to hear the woodwalkers come staggering through the woods. Sure enough, one night, I heard the familiar sound of something crashing eerie and slowly through the woods behind the house. I leapt up and rushed to gather the things I intended to carry outside with me, as I went to confront whatever it was that passed through the woods. I frantically pulled off my sweatpants and put on my jeans. I searched for my keychain, then unlocked the lockbox in which I kept my pistol. I loaded my ammunition into the pistol and tucked it into my belt. 
I grabbed my flashlight and quietly descended into the basement, then out the back door into the backyard. It took me far too long to get outside. By the time I cautiously strode out under the moonlight, I could hear the noisy movement of the woodwalkers receding into the distance. I walked slowly and stealthily out onto the edge of the woods and pulled my pistol out my belt. I crept soundlessly down the hill into the dark woods. I positioned myself defensively behind a large tree in case the woodwalkers carried firearms. I peered warily into the direction of the noise, my eyes strained to see whatever it was that was out there, but I could discern nothing through the shady branches of the forest. After a while, I pointed my flashlight towards the direction of the noise and turned it on. My night vision was instantly ruined by the reflection of light from the tangled mass of trees and branches. I turned the light off and listened to the sound of the woodwalkers fade away, and I went back inside in defeat. To this day, I wonder about the strange mystery of the woodwalkers. I'll never know who or what it was. This encounter happened recently, when I was hiking with my husband and son. We went hiking to this spot in South Cali, where I've been going for the last 13 years. The hiking trails are basically located all along the cliff. Some trails lead to a secluded beach, others to a cave. We took the trail that leads to the beach, and we usually kept walking longer than the average person since we are more familiar with the terrain after the trail ends. Around 4.30, we knew it was time to hike back up the trail while watching the sunset. At the same time, the moon was rising on the opposite direction. This moon was huge, probably one of the biggest moons I've ever seen, and this is where we took some pics. We decided once we got back up to the top of the trail around 5.30ish, to keep hiking along some other trail, which we've only been to once. The night was still young, and plenty of families were walking amongst this trail. I decided to take a quick break after a short jog to enjoy the scenery and appreciate the moon. At this time, my husband and son were pretty far from me, and all I could see were their silhouettes. The night was now upon us, and the fog from the Pacific Ocean was making its way up the cliff into the hiking trails. My husband and son decided to turn back and meet me because it was getting dark. My son began to run past us. At this point, my husband looks towards his direction and sees this black silhouette of a tall person standing about nine meters away from my son. As soon as this thing notices that my husband is looking at it, it gets on all fours and takes off like an animal. He yells for my son to come back, and he then tells me what he saw, and says he saw something running across the trail. I'm scared of dogs, so first thing I thought was a stray dog running loose. But he says no, that it's bigger than a dog, and almost the size of a bear. But it had the silhouette of a man standing in the middle of the trail, and it took off on all fours, as soon as he looked at it. He said this thing was darker than the dark around us, and at this point we freaked the hell out. We were hugging each other close, not knowing what to expect next. We were basically in the middle of a trail we've only been to once, with awful phone service. We looked around the trail, and it was completely empty with no one to be seen. We were basically the only ones there. That trail went from being packed with people, to now us three being the only ones there within minutes, which made everything even more terrifying. We decided to suck it up and walk back to our car, which meant we had to pass by where my husband saw this thing on the trail. My husband said he thought he saw this humanoid run down the trail, but once we got to the spot where he saw it, the trail turned right but the figure ran left. To the left was a fence and a bunch of tall bushes, 
making it impossible for something to go that way. Whatever that thing was, it had to have jumped the fence in order to keep travelling down that way. We never saw or heard it jump the fence, and better yet, we never heard its footsteps or anything move in the bushes. My husband said, it just disappeared. We managed to keep walking along the trail while holding his phone flashlight pointed at the fence and bushes where he saw it go towards. All I had was my water bottle, and I was prepared to use it as a weapon if necessary. All we could hope for is that we saw other people on the trail. Then we finally see lights coming from a motorbike towards the end of this trail. This person was going into the trail as we were relieved to be out of it and into the parking lot. When we finally got into the parking lot, it went from 50 cars to only two left. There was this couple standing taking pictures. At this point, even the person on the motorbike had noped out of there. As we made our way back to the car, I joked with my husband how he might have seen a werewolf. He was still in shock and didn't say no, but was trying to process what he had witnessed. My son said he saw something crawling, and that's when my husband called him to come back towards us. He was really scared that night, and refused to sleep alone. We all slept in the same room, and my son said that he felt like it was following us the whole time we were coming home. I certainly hope not. Today we ended up watching this segment on the news by accident while having dinner and heard that today is Super Blood Wolf Moon, and I'm 90% convinced the creature we saw is a werewolf. This location is notorious for many deaths, as it's on a cliff where many have died from falling over or drowning. When we went there for the first time, there was a single, there was a sign about, about someone who fell off a cliff. I'm a man in my mid-thirties, living in a forest area of West Virginia. I had just gotten a German Shepherd puppy from the dog pound, and needless to say, I watched her like a hawk. I didn't want anything to happen to her. Unfortunately in life, things don't often go the way we'd like them to, do they? She escaped a week after I got her. It wasn't that I'm not a good owner, but she must have gotten interested in something and ran away. I put up lost dog posters everywhere, but no one called despite the $5,000 cash reward I had offered anyone who found her. I soon got discouraged. It was hard to believe that I would never see her again. And one night, I was sitting in front of the TV absentmindedly, just thinking about stuff, when I heard a familiar bark. I reacted out of foolish excitement and burst out my door, and I heard the bark again coming from the woods. Without thinking, I ran into the forest, shouting her name. With no response, I took the time to figure out where I was. I was deep in the woods, and I had no light except my phone, as well as no sense of direction. I began to panic, and I suddenly forgot all about my dog. And then I heard an ungodly shriek. It echoed and faded. I was so terrified I thought I would pass out. I kept walking and soon found myself on a dirt road. It seemed wide enough for a car, and I started making my way down it. And then I saw headlights again. In the darkness, I couldn't see the car. I couldn't even see two feet ahead of me. But I was sure I was looking at headlights. I ran towards them, waving and making a stupid amount of noise. The headlights remained still, and then they blinked. That's when I knew they weren't headlights. I stopped cold in my tracks and almost cried. The eyes lifted higher, but whatever the creature was, it was tall, at least nine feet, and around twenty feet ahead from me. I didn't want to run. I didn't think I could in my state of fear. Instead, being the idiot I am, I turned on my phone and aimed the light at it. 
He was wearing a red plaid shirt and jeans. His skin was a greyish colour, and something was horribly wrong with his face. I just screamed, dropped my phone and ran like hell. I didn't care where I ran. I knew I just had to get away from that thing. I looked back. It remained there, eyes glimmering, making no attempt to chase me. I eventually found my way back to civilization, and spent the night in an older couple's home and told them the story. Oh yeah, the old man said, leaning back in his chair as I described the creature. I've met a few folks who have seen that thing. Round here, we call him the Bubba Jacks. He's kind of a legend around these parts. I really hope not to run into it again. So my story begins in the sticks of Missouri, at an old campsite. For a few years, everyone on my mum's side of the family would meet and stay at this campsite owned by a family friend. It lies on the Mississippi and is miles away from any town. It's about 20 acres overall of mostly cleared land, but with woods lining the perimeter and has a pool cafeteria, mess hall, gymnasium, and about 10 cabins. It sits next to an old plantation house that was turned into a stop on the Underground Railroad, as it has a secret room behind the fireplace that held people. Anyway, my mother, her siblings, and my grandmother all went to camp there when they were about 10 to 13 years old so this place is at least 90 years old. There are signatures all over the cabin interior from past campers, dating back from the early 20th century, and perhaps earlier, until present. The aunts and female cousins, myself included, stayed in one cabin, while the men stayed in another, and my brother and one cousin decided to be bold and stay in the one up the hill by themselves. Needless to say, they didn't get much sleep that night, and were pretty creeped out by the next day. But this isn't their story. On my side of the room, we had pushed the beds together, three of them, to make some sort of giant combo bed. I was on the bottom of a bunk bed, at the edge of a combo bed furthest from the half-screened wooden door, and my cousin Allison was on the top bunk, and two other cousins were to my right, in the other beds. So after the last day, we were winding down from all the activities and fun, and were telling stories, until eventually we drifted off to sleep one by one. A few hours later, I woke, for no apparent reason. But when I looked towards the screen, I saw blonde slash whitish hair, bouncing about outside. I didn't think much of it, because my cousin, who was with my brother, had a big blonde afro at the time. I figured they were just messing around, and went back to sleep. A bit later, I awoke again, and saw a complete apparition of a woman, standing in the centre of the cabin, rapidly surveying the room. She was almost completely opaque, I'd say about 85%, and was dressed in 19th century working class garb apron, long-sleeved dress, and wore a disheveled bun. She was looking around the room, to me, and seemed confused as to what we were all doing there, but I did not feel that she was a negative presence. At this point, I was still in a stupor for having been awoken in the middle of the night, so I grabbed my flashlight that was next to me, shined it on her and said, What? in a whispered yell. Had I been completely conscious, this probably wouldn't have happened, but I felt reflexive. When the light hit her, she vanished. When she vanished, I felt unable to comprehend what happened at this point in the night, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, I had somewhat of a realization of what happened, but I didn't want to tell anyone out of fear of having it dismissed as nothing, 
and no one believing me. We were all getting ready for the day and walking to the mess hall for lunch when my cousin Allison asks me if I'd seen anything weird in the night. Shocked and relieved, I recount the story to her. Apparently, she had awoken just before me and saw the woman in the room. Not knowing how to react, she slowly turned over and tried to fall asleep again. Moments later, she heard me click my flashlight and exclaim. She said she also didn't want to feel that she was a negative presence and thought that she looked as though she was checking up on us and making sure that everyone was okay. We recently went back over this story together and it turns out we've both experienced unexplainable things throughout our lives. We've just never talked to it to anyone because we assumed no one would understand or want to understand. She suggested we possessed some sort of sensitivity to these kind of energies, and since her realizing it in herself has honed her ability. I agree with her, and the fact that we were the only two to feel her and wake up seems significant. Anyway, we told the story to the rest of the family, and everyone was spooked. We haven't returned to the campsite since. I assume it's because everyone assumes no one would want to go again because of what happened. But, like Alison and I said, she wasn't malefic at all, and I would be happy to return. My brother and I have always loved nature and wildlife. My brother is in the military, and I work in the outdoors. We've probably spent more time in nature than anyone we know. We know animals and their distinctive sounds, as well as their behaviours. Wolves in particular have always fascinated us, because they've always behaved strangely in our presence. The first of these experiences was around 10 years ago. We used to travel to an island near the house that required kayaking for a kilometre to get there. We were walking in the night, and suddenly found ourselves surrounded by seven wolves. We used pepper spray against them, and went to take refuge in a tree. The wolves stayed all night at the foot of the tree. My brother returned there alone afterwards, and one night he was walking, and an animal yelled at him. He didn't see the animal, but the sound of it terrified him. A scream of a man, with a deep voice, mixed with the cry of a baby. He fired six rounds to where the sound was coming from, and the animal yelled louder and fled. The sound of his footsteps indicated that he was running on two legs. He was big enough to break everything in this path, and we went back and saw many signs of what we thought were associated with a Bigfoot. This story stayed there because we didn't really believe it. My brother later moved 400 kilometers from this place, close to one of Canada's largest protected forests. Whenever we go into this forest, we are there between five or six hours and end up surrounded by aggressive wolves. When we do not leave early enough, we are forced to shoot in their direction in order to scare them off which doesn't really work. We've been surrounded by wolves at least 10 times. Until recently, I thought it was just a particularly aggressive pack. To leave this wood, we must walk a few kilometers, then take the truck, which requires us to go three to four kilometers in an old dirt road. We were returning quietly during the night, when on my right I saw a white light orb around 30 feet from us in the forest, floating 10 feet high in the air. There was no house or road more than 5 kilometers away. We believed it was a hunter or hiker in distress with a flashlight. My brother took his rifle and his headlamp and went to see in the woods. He saw nothing and returned 10 minutes later. When he came back, I was scared. First he arrived from behind the truck, until he was about within a meter of the truck. What I saw in the rearview mirror was a grizzly bear. Keep in mind, 
there are no grizzlies in this area. In addition, I asked him why he turned off his lamp for five minutes. He tells me he never turned it off, and he always had the truck in sight. There was no drop where he was, and finally when I could not see his lamp, I saw a moose pass 10 meters ahead of the truck. We were frightened. Finally, he was camping last night with his girlfriend, more than a hundred kilometers from this place. During the night, they were awoken again by a pack of wolves that surrounded them. His girlfriend had already reported a year ago having seen this same light orb nearby, and she mentioned that she had seen a grey creature without ears crossing the road on two legs. In short, she didn't think about it until she heard our story. The wolves, the lights, the bipedal creature, a strange impression that we are not welcome a few hours before anything happens. We're not really sure what to believe. Could it be a Wendigo? Or something else? What do you think? I have had a few paranormal experiences in my life, but this one stands out in my mind. I am a 22 year old male, currently in my last semester of college. This story takes place during my freshman year at the same college. I go to a smaller university in Connecticut. It's located pretty much at the base of a popular state park with a large mountain. If you're familiar with Connecticut, I'm sure you can guess which university I'm referring to. There is a lot of Native American folklore associated with the mountains, as Native American tribes used to live in the surrounding area, and some weird stuff has definitely happened there. A kid even fell to his death while hiking not too long ago, but I highly doubt that was due to anything paranormal. Behind my freshman dorm building, there was a steep hill that led into the woods. This was where everyone in our building would go to smoke weed. Halfway up the hill, there was a little cleared out space with a concrete wall that you could sit on, and then a much larger area on the top of the hill with trails and a bigger concrete wall. It was a nightly occasion for my roommates and I to go up there and to smoke so we were completely fine for going at any time. One night, my roommate and I headed to the hill just like we did on most nights. Our other roommate stayed behind because he had to do work. We climbed the hill and went to the smaller clearing halfway up rather than the large one. There was no one else up there and it was a little later than we normally went. But like I said, we felt safe enough to go there at any time. We smoked a few bowls and just hung out for a while. Keep in mind, both of us smoked pretty regularly, so two bowls wasn't gonna do much for us, and I'm definitely not the type to get paranoid while stoned, so our sobriety, or lack thereof, was not an excuse for what happened. It was pretty windy that night, so all of the trees around us were loudly swaying. Out of nowhere, the wind completely stopped and the trees fell still. Then the leaves on the trees that were standing by very slowly and eerily fell to the ground, all at the same level and speed. We looked at each other and kind of nervously laughed. Suddenly, we were both filled with this sense of impending doom, like something was telling us to leave the woods immediately. I know this, because my roommate told me he felt the same way after the fact, and we grabbed our weed and fully fledged sprinted out of the woods and down the steep hill. As I was running down the hill, I fell backwards really hard and messed up my elbow. To be honest, it almost felt like I was yanked by something, but there's a definite possibility that I just slipped on the dirt because we were flying down this essentially vertical hill. I picked myself up, and we ran into our dorm building, slamming the door behind us. After that, my roommate refused to go into those woods for the rest of the year. There were a few times where I went back up the hill and into those woods by myself, 
as I didn't feel like walking across campus to go to another spot. For the most part, it was fine. I didn't experience anything. But there were a few other times I would be up there around midnight and would suddenly be filled with the same impending doom feeling to tell me to leave. I haven't gone back to that area since, but I can still see the eerie way those leaves fell around us. I've got a few weird experiences from my grandparents' house, here in rural Mississippi, that I've never been quite able to explain. To start, I'd like to say I'm a very objective and logical person. Not bragging, just my own personality that I recognize. If something happens, I generally never let my mind wander to crazy, far-fetched places. The first experience happened when I was 11, while watching TV with my grandmother Mimi. I thought everything was normal until I turned to look at her. She was staring right through me both eyes dilated and glazed over. Mimi? I asked, and she turned her head unnaturally quickly upwards, and reached her hand up, and said in a slow soft voice, It's so fluffy. Soft. Airy. Touch it. And then slowly let her arms down and went right back to watching TV. Obviously I was in shock, and even whimpered a little bit, because I just couldn't understand what happened. She heard me and asked if I was okay, and I just kept asking her what she meant, and why she did that. But she was confused, and tried to calm me down. She didn't remember any of it. She was young for a grandma at the time, and never showed any signs of dementia or Alzheimer's since. Nothing at all since that day and she's always been of sound mind. The next story took place a few years later. I was 15 now, and at the time my brother was 17, and it was pretty late at night. My grandparents' property is surrounded by woods on both sides, leading to a deep forest on the left, one of evergreen, and ending with a lake with other houses within throwing distance. I've grown up my whole life in those woods and have seen many critters and was never really scared of them. They were more of a place of comfort and aloneness. I digress, back to the story. My brother and I were walking up the long driveway that ended at the road. Because we kept hearing noises like moving branches by the tree line, we thought we should check it out. We both knew whatever is in the woods was more likely to be a raccoon, possum or coyote. Whatever. We knew that we could easily overpower it if necessary. On our way back from investigating, I heard walking behind us, and turned around to see. It was pretty dark, and the only thing we had for light was from my phone, which wasn't much. And all I could see were these two bright eyes staring back, maybe three to four feet from the ground. I don't know what it was, but even now thinking about those eyes and its presence filled me with the most terrific dread imaginable. It's like all my blood turned to ice, and I couldn't stop shaking. It wasn't just basic instinctual fear, but absolute dread. I immediately grabbed my brother's arm and ran as fast as I could to the porch, which had a light that shines about ten feet into the yard. Whatever this thing was followed us, and when I made it to the porch and turned around, it had stopped just outside of the light, just enough to see those eyes. The way it swayed almost made me vomit. I've never seen any animal sway like that, and move its head so oddly. This thing was too large to be a rabid raccoon or coyote. My brother and I quickly got inside and turned off all the lights, and hid under our blankets. In my college days about 20 years ago, me and a friend often took off for the North Georgia mountains on the weekend. When we wanted to smoke, drink, and commune with nature, these mountains were perfect. 
On the weekend, this unsettling event occurred to me. My friend Bill and his German Shepherd Monty headed out towards Sky Valley. It was the beginning of fall semester at UGA, and not much was going on yet. We had found an area where a dirt road led back a half mile, and then we would hike in another mile or so and set up camp near a creek. Excellent trails were nearby, with fun places to explore, not to mention flat ground perfect for setting up camp. Bill and I arrived at our spot around 4pm, and got a fire going. We were musicians, Bill a guitar player, and me a percussionist. So we sparked a joint and started jamming. Around 10, after jamming a while, we chatted about life and girls before tucking in for the night. It was a clear night, so we slept under a blanket of stars. It is important to note we never had seen any sign of another person in the area during any of our other trips. But at two in the morning, I was awoken by Monty growling. It was a deep, guttural growl. Bill was still dead to the world, and I sat up looking around and listening, thinking maybe an animal had come near our campsite. The fire was only embers at this point. I heard barely audible voices in the distance, focusing on the area of the voices. I saw a faint red glow, followed by another faint red glow to the left of the first. This was about a hundred yards away. My mind connected what I was seeing. Cigarette embers. They were getting closer. Bill, wake up. Bill roused from his sleep, and I explained what was going on. At this point, Monty started barking as the strangers approached camp. By the time we stood up, they were in camp, completely unfazed by the now rabid 70 pound German Shepherd. Two incredibly unkept, late 30s, early 40s, deliverance looking guys walked up on us. Bill told Monty to calm down. I will never forget the look of these guys, skinny as hell, about 5 foot 8, shirts caked in grime, mangy beards, and probably five teeth between the two men. Each had huge knives attached to their belt buckles. What you boys doing out here? Look like you're having a good time. We responded and told them that we had been out here to camp and drink some beer. They asked if we had any weed, and we gave them a joint. They looked around a bit, and asked if we wanted to smoke with them. We declined, saying we were heading out early. Throughout the conversation, anything Bill or I said, they looked at each other before responding. Finally, before they left, one of them said, Y'all yeah, stay safe. You never know who you could run into out here. Followed by a laugh as they walked away. We packed up early and left. While this isn't super creepy, these guys were the epitome of backward redneck. The fact that we only woke up because of the dog still sketches me out to this day, and I wonder if I hadn't have awoken, or if the dog hadn't been with us, or if this situation had been any part different, if our fates would have been different too. I'm glad we didn't have to find out.